Morning church, hopefully you're having an awesome weekend and I hope you're excited for the Thanksgiving weekend or I should say Thanksgiving week coming up. I know I am and of course uh, today, at least for the campus group, we're going to be having a Thanksgiving potluck and so anyway, the festivities and the feasts begin. That being said, today if you're visiting with us or if you have been here for the last two Sundays, you'll know that we're doing a, a series in the book of Revelation. Now very often the book of Revelation is called Revelations, but there's no S on the end, just an FYI. A couple of quick reminders before we get into the text today is Revelation is such a mysteriously complicated book in part because it was written in what's called apocalyptic literature. This was a literature that uh, came out of troubling times, it was Jewish primarily, its characteristics were, number one, it always had historical significance. The message was always given through visions. There's a predictive element to it, and there's constant use of symbols. Of course, we talked about that in the numbers, as what pops up over and over in the book of Revelations. Revelation. See, I just even did it. Uh, that being said, there are multiple methods of interpretation of the book of Revelation. The most common is the futurist, meaning that people apply the book of Revelation towards exactly what they're going through in their time period, which often is thousands of years after the time in which the book was actually written. What is the method of interpretation we're using? Well, I don't have a name for it, but in Revelation 1.1, the Bible says that, that John was going to be shown what soon must take place. So, number one, we know that there was a not only historical significance, but there was a very real significance for the people in which it was first written to, which is the seven churches of Asia. In Revelation 1.19, he kind of lays out the format of the book. He says, I'm going to show you what is now, what was, and what will soon be. So past, present, and of course there's a futuristic element towards the book of Revelation as well. What was the historical significance or what was happening during this time? Well, the, the, the Jews, God's people, uh, along with Christians really all around uh, Asia at this time and really around the world, were being heavily persecuted by the Roman emperor Domitian. Domitian was a very, very wicked man who ordered and demanded that he be deified while alive and worship, which of course provided a huge problem for the early Christians. That being said, let's get into our text. And if you remember from last week, John gets, gets a vision and he goes through this gigantic door and he gets to look in to heaven. Last week's lesson was all about God. And here we find a second figure, or perhaps the same and yet different characteristic that pops up. Let's begin reading in Revelation 5 and verse 1. The Bible says, then I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides, and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside of it. I wept and I wept because no one was found. Who is worthy to open the scroll or look inside? Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the hand of him who sat down on the throne. In a right here, we see that Jesus emerges. The Bible says that, that this, this, this scroll was in the hand of God. And the angels say, Who, who's able to open this? And literally no one on heaven or on earth was worthy until, of course, the Lamb of God, Jesus himself, emerges. Now, I, I think what's cool here 
is the Bible describes him as the Lion of Judah. Of course, if you go back in the lineage of Jesus, you'll find out that he did in fact come from the tribe of Judah. And the Bible describes him as a lion. Lions are very powerful. And then he goes into it, he then calls him the Lamb. So here we have two very important characteristics that are really opposite that embodies Jesus. Number one is we understand that Jesus was the Lamb of God. You go all the way back in the Old Testament, Jesus was the sacrifice, and in the Old Testament, the Lamb was the blood offering very often for sin that was shed in place of people's sin. Ultimately, Jesus comes and becomes the Lamb of God, the ultimate sacrifice for all of mankind. But secondly, he brings up the fact that he's also a lion. Well, keep in mind here that Jesus now is glorified. And I think it's very important to know that in multiple depictions in the book of Revelation, Jesus still has the stains of blood on his robe and, of course, visibly the scars of his wounds. What a scary sight that would be. We have, of course, in Revelation 1 and, and Revelation 19, Jesus looks, he looks scary. I mean, he's, he's glorified, he's glowing, he has this ferocious look, he looks like a lion. And he's still wearing the blood-stained clothes in which he was crucified. Yeah. On top of that, the Bible says he has seven horns and seven eyes. We understand from our previous study that seven is the number of perfection. In apocalyptic literature, horns were always a reference towards power. So here Jesus is perfected or the complete embodiment of power. And on top of that, he is omnipresent. He's everywhere, and he can see everything. That's the seven eyes. Complete eyesight of the entire world. Here we have not a weak lamb, but a lamb that was slain and has come back a lion. The Bible says that not only does he walk up to God, but he takes the book out of God's hand. Now, very interesting. The word used for take, this... It, it, it doesn't mean that God gave him the book. The actual word means that he taketh it from him. So he when he grabbed the book and he took it, why? Who on earth could walk up to God and take the book from the hand of God? Only what? The Lamb of God, Jesus, who was worthy. Today the title of the message is, Worthy is the Lamb. And that's pretty pretty awesome here there are three different groups that are going to be worshiping the lamb and for three different reasons they will be singing songs to Jesus now amazingly what they highlight is not what Jesus got that made him worthy they highlight what Jesus gave that made him worthy Point number one, and the first thing Jesus gave was blood. Going back to our text in Revelation 5, the Bible says in, in verse 6, I'm sorry, go down to verse 8. It says, and when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lap. Each one had a harp, and they're holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God. God's people. And they sang a new song, said, You are worthy to take the scroll. And it opens its seals. Because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, and people, and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. You know, right here, the Bible lays out that, that Jesus was worthy because of the blood that he shed for mankind. I love the way that it's put. It actually says that with your blood, you purchased for God persons. 
Jesus purchased with his blood people. And as we see here, it's all people of all nations. We understand Jesus did not just make a sacrifice. It wasn't an accidental sacrifice that he was led to. This was a deliberate decision. It was a deliberate plan. It was not without purpose. It was a deliberate act. It was what sacrifice is and always should be. You know, I know that for all of us who are still alive, which I, I'm hoping everyone who's listening is still alive. If not, that would be a little weird and maybe be some of the Walking Dead type stuff, which I don't believe in. But being that we are all alive, none of us have sacrificed to the extent that Jesus has. We all still have our blood. And so as we look at this and go, well, if we're to be imitators of Jesus, and Jesus shed his blood, and yet I've not yet been called to do that, how does this apply to me? Well, we understand blood, sweat, and tears ultimately to be effort. Whenever you use the phrase blood, sweat, and tears, it's talking about the effort that we give towards God. Once again, our effort cannot be an accident. Our effort cannot be without purpose. Our effort must be a deliberate action in order for it to have an impact. You know, the Bible talks about here that, that Jesus' desire was that all nations come to know God. And on top of that, all nations become a kingdom of men that are put together as a family. You know, I really believe that one of the greatest challenges we have as Christians is to fulfill the plan of God to get to all nations. And one of the greatest challenges of being in a church that actually believes that is we very often find ourselves at odds with the church when we're not feeling like being sacrificial. I think very often in our perfect utopian mindset, we want to have the effectiveness of people that are sacrificial, that are deliberate, and that are purposeful. And yet, we don't want to give the effort to be that. Well, we understand here, getting to all nations does not happen on accident. It takes specific planning and deliberate action. But ultimately, it takes your best effort to accomplish. On top of that, once people get right with God, then the real challenge begins. I, I always love when people go, oh, you, you, you made it. Well, when you get baptized, you didn't really make it. It's sort of like you started it. You began the journey of God. But then what happens after you get baptized, and all of a sudden you come and you join our kooky family, so to speak, of people that have all kinds of different backgrounds, cultures, issues, baggage, and when we all come together, the Bible says God's plan is not only to redeem man, but to make man a family of God, of priests that are there to serve their God. Once again, you do not have a church that is a functional family without great effort to remain unified. What does it take? Well, it takes blood, sweat, and tears. It takes effort. You know, when I think of our church, I think of a group that, as I've mentioned before, has great talent. And I think as a church, we have great intentions. And yet when I think about this, this scripture and really looking at what Jesus did, do I see our church as deliberately acting with great effort in order to see the plan of God come to fruition. In all honesty, I do not. I believe one of our greatest challenges as a church is there are a lot of us who have stopped giving our full effort quite some time ago. 
we still want the same results of people that do give their full effort. And yet, we're not really willing to go after it and to give our whole heart and our whole effort at this time. As a result, what happens is that we've experienced mediocre results. Now, I know it's during the time of the pandemic, and I know that there's a lot of weird things that have happened this year that would, in a sense, stack the deck against any church that's trying to help people become Christians, particularly when you can't shake hands or, you know, or at least it's not uh, socially acceptable anymore to shake hands and people are walking around in masks. And yet there are churches all around the United States that are actually having some of the best years of growth they've ever had. So obviously I'm the leader and part of this is on me. I really believe that as a church, we need to repent in this. We need to give our full effort and really to shed the blood of effort in order to make things happen here in Hilo and see the plan of God realized. I think secondly is, I think a lot of us have given up of really being unified 100% with one another. Do you realize that God puts people that are totally different together and he expects them to be unified? But once again, that doesn't just happen. Only in a utopian world do people come together and they go, wow, it's just going to happen. No. The Bible says in John 17 that, that Jesus said, you got to bring them to unity. People they have to be brought to unity through scriptures and through calling to repent. Only then can we be a kingdom that serves God when we, of course, are following the word of God. You know, I'm going to ask you today, do you feel like you are giving your full effort in our quest to evangelize the world and our quest to help one another to stay faithful? If not, you got to look at this and go, wow, if I'm an imitator of Jesus and Jesus laid out his blood from his body, I need to lay out, if not my physical blood, at least every effort that I have in my life. Why was Jesus worthy? Number one, it was the blood. Why were the elders and the living creatures, why were they singing this song to Jesus? It was because the elders were saved by the blood of Jesus. Number two, what was the second thing that Jesus gave up that made him worthy? Power. In Revelation chapter 5, and beginning in verse 11, Bob says, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They served with the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power, and wealth, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and praise. So pretty amazing. You can kind of sort of imagine. You have the elders and the living creatures, of course, all creation. They're singing to God, and all of a sudden, after their song is ended, the angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, begin singing to God, particularly to Jesus here. And the Bible says when they do that, the first thing they mention is power. Of course, others are mentioned as well, but I want to highlight this topic for a second. You know, right now in the United States, we see that there is a huge, huge push for power. And being that in the political world, there is, of course, I think the number one desire of most all politicians is not the service of the people, but rather power that goes with the job. And part of that is, is people in general, we love power. Well, this led me to do some uh, study. And one of the, 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 the names that has constantly been brought up this year is a guy named Karl Marx. And Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto. And you might be wondering, well, well this guy, I, I've heard about that. This guy must be wicked. He's the one that, that, of course, Hitler used to 
persecute the Jews. He's the one that uh, is responsible for so many deaths. What's so wicked about it? Is it a murderous book? Well, actually, if you study it out and you, you read about it, the problem is not exactly what he says in the sense of he doesn't say go around and murder everybody. But the heart of what he says is in his book, he breaks down the world into two types of people. You have victims and you have oppressors. He believed the working class were victims of the oppressors. And the whole point of his manifesto is teaching people that have perceived no power to go and seize power. Well, of course, what happens when you do that and when you tell people they're victims and you're telling them that other people are stealing from them, eventually it creates murder. It's the heart of what he teaches that is so dangerous. Of course, socialism and communism has been responsible for, I think, more deaths than any other sort of thing. I think more than any war that's ever happened. That's how deadly this teaching is. The problem is everyone is a victim to a certain point of view. As an example, the, the woman might come to the man and say, well, well I'm a victim because men are oppressing women. Then another woman comes who is a homosexual woman and says, well, I'm a victim because you straight women are oppressing us homosexual women. And then a transgender person comes and a different racial person comes. I mean, it just keeps going on and on and on. But the problem, the biggest problem, is power is never something that you should desire. On top of that, power is not something that you go and take. To go and take power has deadly consequences. In that manifesto, he gives them the tactics in order to seize power. He teaches them to use emotional or literal blackmail to get people to do what you want. What's the goal? It's to control people into doing what you want them to do. To meet your needs. And it has no consideration for other people. They might be wondering, well, well, why are you talking about all of this in a sermon? Well, I think it's very important to understand just how bad this is. In the sense, not, not about the teaching, which is bad. But the point I'm trying to make here is when you want power or to take power, it leads to very dark places. They might be saying, well, well I, I, I don't really care about all that. I'm just a normal person and yada, yada, yada. Well, you may or may not think that is any relevance to you, but I assure you that it does. In relationships, very often there is a struggle for power which creates bad relationships. We see it in marriage. Very often a wife or even maybe a husband will use emotional blackmail to get the other person to do what they want them to do. And they have control issues. Well, that's pretty relevant, I would say. We see that even in our relationships with one another. Very often in church, we'll hold something the other person has done over their head to either not want to fellowship with them or to control them into doing what they want or you want them to do or into meeting your needs with no consideration for theirs. Now, Jesus was given power, but the Bible does not say he went to take power. Let's find out what the heart of Jesus actually was. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Now, mind you, before Jesus came to earth, he already had the power. So he didn't need to take it. He already had it. But let's see what he did with the power. 2 and verse 1. Bob says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. Having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind, 
do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And right here, Paul's laying out, he goes, hey, in your relationships with one another, the question is not what can you do for me? The question is what can I do for you? Don't look to your own interests. Look to the interests of others. So the opposite of emotionally black, blackmailing people or manipulating people into doing what you want them to do. Verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearances of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him in the highest place, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. You know, right here, the Bible says that he, being in the very nature of God, and of course we understand the Trinity, but did not consider himself to have equality with God, something to be grasped. The key, though, is he says here, he made himself nothing. I believe in the King James, it says that he emptied himself of his power. Right here, Jesus not only didn't go to take power, he gave up his power, and he got rid of all of it. Why? But because in order to help man and influence men, he had to become just like men. You know, a number of years ago, I was excited to celebrate Brett's birthday, and I, I think it was number seven or number eight, which is pretty crazy. Uh, this year, Connor is going to be turning nine, and Bree's going to be turning seven. Let's not even talk about Brett turning 15. I mean, it's crazy how fast these kids grow. Well, I was trying to think of something to get Brett, and, and I, I couldn't really think of what to get. And I believe that year he wanted a pet of some, some sort. And, of course, I, I didn't want to get a dog, and we were living in a rented apartment. And so I, you know, I had some rules I had to stick to. And so finally I, I went to a pet store, and I was walking around, and I saw a fish. And I go, well... That's a pretty good idea. Fish must be really easy to take care of. That is not true. In fact, if you want to clean poop out of a fish tank very often, get a pet fish. Anyhow, I got two fish, and I didn't know that they were fighting fish. And uh, anyway, the next day I, I came out, and one of them was dead because the other one had attacked it. And I think he ate too much because later that day he died too. Well... Then I got another fish, and in like three days, that fish died too. So I, I think after the first one, I had to like do a little burial ceremony with Brad, and we flushed it down the toilet because he was crying. And so finally, I went back to the, the, the pet store, and I go, okay, you got to help me. Give me or point me towards two fish I can't kill. I was all oh, no problem. And uh, he showed me these pretty uh, hardy goldfish, and I bought two of them. Well, of course, the, the goldfish started growing fast, and so I went from one tank to a second tank, and then I was cleaning it all the time. And Anyway, one day I was thinking, I go, you know, if I'm going to put all this effort into these fish, there should be some sort of enjoyment I get out of it. I wonder if I can pet the fish. Well, that sounds like a crazy story, but it's, I assure you it's true. What I was thinking at the time, I do not know. So that day I went down and I, I stuck my hand in the tank and I was trying to pet the fish and the fish ran as fast as possible from my hand. And I started thinking, I go, wow, well, what's wrong with these fish? I mean, surely they must notice through the glass that every day I'm feeding them. Surely they must know that I'm the one always cleaning up after them. Why would they not let me pet them? Believe it or not, the fish never let me pet them, and they never felt comfortable with me doing so. And I started thinking, well, well, what way could I assure these fish that I meant no harm to them? 
eventually my thought led me to the fact that I would actually have to become a fish to somehow communicate with them. Now, this might be a funny way to tell the story of Jesus, but that's essentially what Jesus did. You have in the Old Testament where the very voice of God made the people so afraid that they begged him to stop speaking. So what did God do? He had to come down in human likeness as a man, empty himself of all of his power. And only then could he truly communicate the message of love to a fallen people. That is our God, and that is his example. Power is not something to take, it's something to give. The number one sign that your relationships are bad, or the, one of the number one reasons why your relationships are commonly bad and consistently bad, is that you have a desire to be in power and not love. You know, I really believe one of our greatest challenges as a church, as I mentioned in the point prior, is to be unified. And throughout the last couple of months, I've been made aware of more and more conflicts with different Christians. And very often these conflicts have not really been resolved where people will sort of give lip service to the idea of unity, but they really don't fully forgive. And what of course comes out of that is emotional blackmail, manipulation, but it all comes from a desire that your needs are, your needs are met. Christianity is not about your needs. It's not. Christianity is about a God, about Jesus himself who considered not his needs. He came down from heaven and died one of the most gruesome deaths. Why? It's not because he was thinking about himself. It's because he was thinking about you and thinking about me. If Christianity has become all about you, you're not living Christianity. And if you are one of the people that's in conflict with another brother or another sister, I really want to encourage you, it's time to repent. Consider the example of Jesus. Have a great talk with that person and apologize. I, I think one of the biggest problems that we have when it comes to forgiving is we don't know how to do it. We think that in order to forgive someone, they have to come and apologize to us, and only then can we forgive. I always teach that if you want to forgive someone, you need to apologize to that person for your bitterness. And yes, bitterness is a sin, and it's wrong. If you have bitterness in your heart, it's time to let go of the power. Let that person out of the emotional prison that you put them in, and fully forgive them, and consider their needs, and not just your own. The third and final thing that Jesus gave up that made him worthy was time. Go back if you can to Revelation chapter 5. You know, one more comment on our previous point. You might be wondering, why, why, does the, why do the angels highlight power? Why did they highlight that? Why did they see Jesus worthy? Think about it. The greatest angel, according to the scriptures, was Satan. Created by God as the most glorious. He was actually a guardian cherubim or angel. And the angels that were present had seen him fall. Why? Because Satan desired power and not love. Revelation 5 and, and verse 13. Let's find out a little bit more about time. Bible says, Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and on the sea and all that is in them say, Be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. The elders fell down and worshipped. Now right here I think what's awesome is here you have people that are under the earth. Of course, I, I, I believe from my studies talking about Hades. And then it talks about people that are in heaven and they're singing to God and they lay out that he lives forever and ever. Why? Because Jesus is eternal. Not only does he have eternal life, but he offers it to all. You know, time is a really interesting thing. And um, 
One of the guys who talks about time, I think more than any other author in the Bible, is our dear brother Solomon, King Solomon. If you go to Ecclesiastes 3, we're going to look at what he has to say. Now, you might be wondering, why does Solomon write so much about time? I've actually found that most people that are extremely rich are fairly fascinated with time. And I think the reason why is that they're enjoying life and they don't want the clock to stop. Well, let's find out a little bit more about time. The Bible says Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 1. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time for hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He's made everything beautiful in its time. He has done from the beginning, or he has set also eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to drink and find satisfaction in all of their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing can be taken away from it. God does it so people will fear him. Whatever is already has been, and whatever will be has been before. And God will call the past in to account. You know, this is a beautiful passage, and of course, it's talking about time. The Bible says that there is a time for everything. I don't know about you, but when I read that scripture, I just think about life. That most people during their lifetimes, will experience most of these things. It's called life. What is life? Life is a collection of time. It's an amount of time. And when your time runs out, there is no life. That's the end, at least from an earthly sense. Do you realize that you can buy a watch, but you can't buy time? It's pretty crazy. Do you realize that you can sell your time, but you can never buy your time back? Time, I think, is the most valuable thing that has ever been or will ever be. And yet the Bible says here that God has set eternity in the hearts of men. I really believe that everyone who is alive has a deep understanding that there is something after Death. That's why we all ask the same questions. Is there something more than this? What's my purpose? What happens when I die? Do you realize that, that the fear of death is still one of the top couple of fears? Why? It's because people don't know what's going to happen, but they sense death is not the end. He goes on to say that it's so important that while you live, you take satisfaction, but he's saying that you live well. And then, of course, he ends off with a meaningless aspect of time. Whatever it has will be again. And I think this is such a huge thing. We as human beings, from an earthly sense, have very meaningless lives. You and I will be dead and not too short of a time from now. The sun will keep rising and it will keep setting for years and years and years, at least we assume so, as it has before. To understand how meaningless our lives are in the earthly sense, I would ask you to think right now of, of two of the most famous people from the 1900s. I bet most of you can easily think of one or two. Go back to the 1800s. Just two of the most important people that lived 
Okay, now go back to the 1700s. You see, as you go back, it's harder to even think of two people. Now, consider all the billions of people that have passed from life to death over this time, and yet it's so hard to remember just one or two of them. From an earthly sense, our lives are meaningless. But through God, and only with God, they actually have great meaning. The reason why most people's lives are meaningless is that they use their time unwisely. They spend the minutes, the days, and the hours on themselves and not for the purpose of God. You know, I think what's beautiful is that Jesus came to earth. The Bible says in every temptation that you and I have, he was plagued with every weakness you and I have. And yet, he was not only able to not sin, Jesus came, he stayed the course, and he lived a very short life. At 33 years old, his life was over. We know that if he wanted to, I'm sure he could have lived as long as he wanted. And yet, he sacrificed his days on earth, his time, because he understood when you give your time and you give it to God, God will give you back so much more. You might be wondering, well, well, why were the people that were in the heavens and under the earth, why were they singing to Jesus? Why, why did they lay out forever and ever? I think it's very simple. For those in heaven and those in Hades, their time is over. And you'll either find yourself in one of the two of these places. Hades, of course, as we'll study out more as we get towards the end of the book of Revelation, it is the, the holding place that you go to when someone dies to either go to paradise or they go to Hades, and that's where your punishment is for your disobedience during your life. And I believe that these, these people are, are, are singing to God because they know now. They know that although their lives were bad during their time, they know that even though that they were maybe atheistic, maybe they're indoctrinated with something stupid, now they know the truth, that Jesus is God. And they say he is worthy because he gave up his time. You know, I've got to ask you today, for the hours, the days, the years that you were given, and everyone has a different amount. Will you use that time for God? Or will you let the minutes click away? Until one day on your deathbed you look back and realize that you used your time. Like so many people before you. In an absolutely meaningless way. Will your life matter? In the grand scheme of things. Will you be able to look back one day and go, my time on earth, I had an impact. There was something that happened as a result of the way that I used my time. And of course, they say it ripples through all of eternity. You know, I think what an incredible, incredible text we studied out today. Jesus now has this scroll and everyone in heaven, the elders, the creatures, the angels, those under the earth and in the heavens are all singing praises to God and worshiping him, saying, Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Because he gave his blood, he gave up the power, and he gave God his time. And so today, for us, all we could simply say is, Worthy is the Lamb. With that, let's go to God and pray as we pray for our communion. Father God, I pray right now as we consider the text and the words that come from your mouth, God, I pray that not only are we able to find some encouragement, God, but I pray today that there is a conviction that these scriptures have brought that will help us to get focused as a church, God, to not allow the sacrifice of your son, God, that, that, that we connected with in baptism. Help that not, that baptisms that we've had not to be in vain. Father, I pray for that. 
I pray that during these meaningless years in our life that we can in fact hold in our heart the death of Jesus. And I pray that today we can think about all of this as we consider the cross and we consider his sacrifice. Father, I pray that we'll be able to imitate it. Father, help us to be thankful during this week as we go into Thanksgiving and help us never, never to forget that our ultimate source of gratitude should be the sacrifice of Jesus. We thank you and love you since I pray. Amen. Thanks, guys.